He has published on the early history of China's relations with steppe nomads, for example, ancient China and its enemies, uh, and on the Mongol and Manchu history, uh, Manchu and Mongol relations on the eve of the Qing conquest, and has edited several books as well, uh, including the Cambridge history of Inner Asia. His most recent works explore the use of proxy data from climatology and other paleo sciences in the study of the history of China and Central Asia with special reference to early Eurasian nomads, the Mongol empire and the Qing dynasty. And another exciting development that we have and, and part of what uh, brings Nicola here today is uh, this is a kind of prequel, this talk is a kind of prequel to a, a course that he's offering at Columbia University in the summer uh, A term, which starts in, at the beginning of May and it's called Climate and Inner Asian Empires uh, and the summary of the class for those who might be interested are inner Asian empires from the Huns to the, uh, the Mongols and Manchus were the political creation of pastoral nomads and other people who shared in their cultural sphere, employing an interdisciplinary research approach that includes climate science, history, archeology, span anthropology, and other disciplines. This course will focus on case studies from different periods and regions to explore the potential impact of climate variability on their rise and fall. Uh, and this will be an online course. So I will turn it over now to Nicola de Cosmo. Thank you very much for addressing us today. Uh, thank you very much, um, Gray. This has been a lovely introduction. Thank you. And it's a pleasure for me to be here um, at uh, virtually at Columbia University. And I should thank a number of people because um, colleagues at Columbia has been so generous, so kind. The, of course, um, the history department, the Department of Decision Studies, the Weather Head Decision Institute, but more specifically, some people like Eugenia Lean, Adam Costo, Lydia Liu, Athena Fontenot, who has organized this uh, uh, this this event as well. And um, um, let me let me start sharing my screen now. Um, here, um, and and of course, I should thank everybody. Um, here, who is uh, uh, attending this this virtual talk? So, uh, one of the most difficult things, actually, when we discuss history and climate, for me, is how to begin this conversation. Um, concern about climatic impact on society has acquired, of course, a new urgency these days in this age of uh, global warming and the Anthropocene. But, you know, th this is certainly not the only reason. I mean, it would be very reductive to say that I'm, I've turned to climate just because of these, of these concerns. Historians have been indeed interested in the connections between climate and history for a very long time. And um, uh, today, um, given the advances in climatology and, and paleoclimatology, the terms of the relationship between natural history and natural systems, indeed, and human systems, uh, as the National Science Foundation would put it, ha have changed and present a formidable intellectual challenge that I want to take into my own field of uh, uh, historical uh, investigation and research because I believe it would um, indeed represent a genuine advance in historical knowledge. And that's what I'm going to share with you today, you know, the why that would be a genuine advance. I should also say that uh, um, certain types of history may profit more from science-generated science data than the history of societies that produce massive amounts of written records and documentary archives. And I will return to this question later, but uh, let's just say that there is a differential value in what science data can do for history, depending on the questions we ask, the periods we consider, and the societies we investigate. And for nomadic history, the payoff can be indeed quite substantial. But let me begin with some very simple points that many of you uh, may be familiar with to illustrate how I see, in general terms, the relationship between climate and, and history. As I said, there is nothing new in the idea that climate variability affected human affairs. But um, half a century ago, 
Climatic changes, change was placed squarely on the vision field of historians by French historians, Le Roi Ladouri, uh, to whom we know we owe the notion that climate can itself be the object of historical inquiry, uh, can be, in other words, the object of history. Let me show some features that I think um, uh, um, illustrate the question of uh, climate as an object of history and also of the similarities between climate history and history in, in general. For instance, periodization. From the 1970s onwards, following enhanced knowledge of paleoclimate gleaned from Greenland ice cores, uh, climatologists have worked out, worked out a systematic periodization of climate at the uh, northern hemispheric level in human history from the Roman warm period to the so-called dark ages cool period, perhaps more aptly renamed as little uh, late antique little ice age, the medieval warm period or, or medieval climate anomaly and the Little Ice Age. In short, climate went from being measured on a geological scale to a human and then historical scale. Paleoclimate reconstructions have become much more precise and provide today high resolution data of climate variability at the regional level with timescales compatible with social and political change. And, uh, and time scales are indeed very important. Climate reconstruction and modeling can occur at different time scales. Pyloclimate proxies based on physical, chemical, and biological materials and analyzed and correlated with climate and environmental parameters in the modern world span all time scales from year to year variability to changes occurring over thousands and even millions of years. Historical analysis doesn't get into the millions of years, of course, but certainly operates at different time scales from the single event to several centuries and Brodelian concepts of different temporalities come immediately to mind. Uh, also, Climatic reconstruction can be based on multiple natural proxies combined together, such as sediments, tree rings, pollen, ice cores, historical records even, or cave records, speleothems. Of course, historians also use different types of sources in their analysis, including material sources or inscriptions, graffiti, paintings, all sorts of things. So, here is another similarity, if you like. Over the past couple of decades, a few historians have been making use, together with more traditional sources, of scientific data in a systematic way. Uh, could be genetic data, climate data, epidemiological data. Um, their work is based on different premises, different methods, different objectives. Uh, and there is certainly no unifying paradigm and there is no general theory on how to do this. So I would characterize this situation or this landscape, if you like, as very fluid, somewhat competitive, but above all experimental and certainly challenging, especially in the absence of academic structures that would facilitate the integration between climate research and historical research. Now, in this sort of generic introduction, I'd like to make also two other points uh, regarding method. First of all, it is important to fully recognize the need for a constant reassessment of how people connect climate with social change. We all know that the bête noire, you know, the are, uh, are today as in the past too reductionism and environmental determinism. There, there is today a resurgence of climatic, geographic, and environmental determinism, as well as much debate over, over them, very robust criticism as well. There is certainly a strong tendency or perhaps temptation or even a simple reflex uh, 
when climatic data are introduc uh, introduced in historical analysis to reduce complex interactions to a single property or element that is assumed somehow uh, to provide a sufficient explanation for the whole observed phenomenon. That is reducing complexity and multiplicity to singularity and monocausal arguments. Environmental determinism assume, assumes also that um, an unbroken chain uh, of uh, uh, occurrences originating in climate change or natural disasters can explain historical events and proof is often presented in the form of statistical correlations used as a proxy for causality. While we may criticize such assumptions and methods and by we, I do not mean just historians, since the scientists and social scientists have been equally engaged in uh, critical review of such methods. We, but we still need to ask how we introduce climate into historical analysis without falling into these traps. As I said, we are in an experimental phase right now and we have to expect a certain degree of empirical trial and error. I think a rather successful way of using climate and other science data in, in historical research is the case study. Some of those case studies that have been produced by historians are limited in their explanatory, explanatory power, while others uh, are, um, on the other hand, self-consciously proposed as a window into larger perception of historical processes, a little bit like microhistory, if you like, and not unlike a legal case or a medical case. This is the direction in which I have moved as well with one fundamental difference that is linked to uh, and derives from the kind of history that I actually do in terms of period geography, cultures, etc. Studying in Eurasian empires is not like studying the Chinese empire or the Ottoman empire. We need to appreciate therefore the peculiarities and the limitations of this type of, type of history. But exactly because of these limitations, climate data may have a greater value than they might have for periods and regions for which we have a greater density of, of sources. So all I'm saying here is that the value of climatic environmental data varies according to the questions we ask, but also to the type of history we research. Different societies, depending not only on geography, but also on economy, technology, social and cultural complexity, will display different degrees of vulnerability or resilience with respect to climatic events. The nomadic societies of the steppes of Inner Asia have special features that bind their lifestyle, economy, political and social structures to their environments in special ways that we need to recognize. In that respect, ethnography and anthropology can be very useful, although they are not a substitute for historical research. We know that steppe empires played an important role in world history. One common characteristic is that they encompass different cultural areas and favored what has been called connectivity or at least visibility between societies and civilizations they would otherwise not be connected to each other or, or, or see each other in the same way. So there, uh, the appearance and disappearance of these uh, empires also remain shrouded in, 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 in mystery. We, should, we just do not have very good answers to you know, sometimes very, very big questions. Um, in my work, I've tried to develop an integrated approach in which critical readings of the sources whenever they are available is supplemented with archeological evidence and anthropological and ethnographic knowledge. I look at climate data as an additional tool, not as a substitute for other sources. However, it's, it, it's a very different tool. It's intrinsically different compared with archeological, ethnographic, anthropological uh, 
uh, uh, data, the type of, uh, of knowledge gradient that I have to negotiate is considerably steeper. And this is where, as they say, the rubber hits the road. What I will present to you um, today are four uh, examples of rubber hitting the road effectively. They are the result of collaboration with scientists without whose work, of course, these studies would not exist. And here are the four studies. Um, I've organized them chronologically. The Eastern Turk Empire um, covers a period in the end of sixth century and early seventh century CE. And here are some of the topics that we've been looking, or looking at in terms of climate, the volcanic forcing is an important topic, and then the social and economic impact um, and, and, the, and the political collapse. The um, Uyghur Empire is our second case study, uh, eighth and ninth, uh, ninth century, followed by the rise of the Mongol Empire. Uh, both of these are based in Mongolia, in uh, or central Mongolia, and uh, the last case study will be. Uh, um, um, will relate to a particular Mongol campaign, the invasion of Hungary in 1241-42. So um, let's begin with our first case study, the demise or the collapse of the Eastern Turk Empire. Um, in the winter, uh, this is based on an article that, of course, uh, all of these studies are based on articles that have been published, by the way. So I'm not saying anything uh, particularly new here. Um, in the winter of the year 627 CE, the Kagan of the Eastern Turk Empire, the ruler, uh, Illig Kagan, um, was facing a big crisis. I should say that the Eastern Turk Empire covered a very large territory that went from what is today Inner Mongolia to Lake Baikal in the north and in the, in the west all the way to um, Kazakhstan and, and, and parts of Central Asia. Um, so Ilik Kagan was facing a crisis. This is described in the Chinese sources. Chinese ambassadors who had visited the Kagan reported uh, to the Tang Emperor, Taizong, um, or Li Shimin, that the Turks had uh, lost a large part of their herds, were ravaged by famine, and people could be seen with emaciated body, bodies and bleeding teeth. The Turks had been a thorn in the side of the recently established Tang dynasty for a while, and only a year earlier, in 626, they had launched a military expedition that reached within striking distance of the Tang capital, capital Chan'an, forcing the Chinese emperor to agree to a humiliating treaty before they withdrew. Uh, but a year later, 627, 628, uh, they seem to be, uh, the Turks seem to be at the mercy of the Tang Emperor, allegedly on the brink of collapse. The Emperor's closest advisors urged mounting an attack to destroy the Turks and be done with them once and for all. The Chinese Emperor, however, did not agree. A peace treaty had been signed, even though under duress, with the Turks and attacking them would have violated it. When ministers and councillors argued that the Turks had previously violated treaties themselves and thus the emperor should not be bound by moral or legal arguments, the emperor replied that his dignity forced him to take the higher moral ground. He was not going to behave like a barbarian, in other words. And if he did not respect the pacts, then other people may not place trust in him, regardless of the faithfulness, faithlessness of his, uh, um, of his enemies. 
The choice was not an easy one, since the Turks might have recovered from the crisis. However, the emperor's decision paid off, the crisis indeed deepened. The Chinese source, sources assert, based on eyewitness account, that the, um, the, this, this famine and, and disasters was triggered by a winter, a so-called winter disaster that had decimated the herds and the pastoral economy of the Turks. Now, the description is consistent with a phenomenon that occurs fairly recently, actually, in Mongolia. This is an example of some cattle frozen to death in a relatively recent uh, so-called Zod disaster, which is a, 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 um, a, a natural catastrophe caused by heavy snowfalls and very frigid winter temperatures so that the animals die of uh, um, hypothermia, actually. Uh, this so disaster decimated the uh, Mongolian um, livestock in 2010. There was another one even more severe in 1999-2000. So it's, it, it's a phenomenon that it's a type of catastrophe that occurs regularly. Of course, today, the government and the international community can intervene to allevi alleviate the crisis. But, you know, how would they get out of this crisis in the 7th century CE? So uh, one of the first things that we did was to reconstruct the climate in order to verify the information in the sources and also assess the, the timing of the uh, uh, of, of the climate events and see whether they correlated with this uh, social, economic, political crisis. Um, so this is a general description of the kind of uh, climatic sources. There are 16 three ring chronologies that apply to this, uh, that include this period. This period is rather early. Um, and, and are somewhat relevant to the reconstruction of climate in this particular area, as we, as we shall see. Moreover, ice core data uh, revealed a volcanic eruption powerful enough to have caused even lower temperatures. This is known as volcanic um, forcing. So here you see um, the volcanic eruptions. The one that interests us is this one in 626. And here you see the temperatures and which are quite depressed in this, uh, in, 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 uh, um, at the same time, the same year of the volcanic, uh, volcanic eruption, the same general period that is between 627 and 630. Um, and uh, the chronology, the Twering chronology, comes from the Russian Altai region, and with these spatial correlations, we can see that includes also the uh, region uh, of the uh, Turk Empire. So it affected the Turk Empire. We can see that quite clearly. Uh, here is another another uh, illustration of the same of the same chronology. And you can see here that the, uh, you know, how cold with respect to a median temperature the, um, uh, that particular year, year was. Um, so this is the uh, marked in blue, uh, the period, period of, uh, of uh, so-called late antique Little Ice Age, which uh, uh, includes this, uh, this uh, particular event that affected the Turk, the Turk Empire. So, um, the limitation, uh, by the way, of these uh, tree ring reconstruction is that they represent summer temperatures only. So how do we know the winter temperature? Well, uh, there are other ways to reconstruct winter temperatures, but in this case, because of the volcanic eruption, we, uh, we uh, and the volcanic forcing, depresses temperature through the year, we can safely assume that winter temperature will also very, very low. 
So at this point, we know that indeed there was a there was a very very low temperature, which is consistent with what we find in the Chinese sources. At this point, what did the Kagan do? This is the most important thing. Well, we know that there was a crisis. The Kagan tried to move his people out of the area where, with the most severe weather, and to impose requisitions of food and animals on subordinate tribes. But the pastures to the south, where he might have moved under different circumstances, were not accessible because Chinese armies had been stationed at the border and would not let them through. The subordinate tribes, in the meanwhile, probably facing a similar crisis, began to rebel and to defy the extraordinary taxation imposed on them. So the situation became more and more desperate as the Kagan was running out of options uh, and the crisis deepened even further because of a second bad winter. The high mortality of the animals extended to famine, reduced, um, and the extended famine reduced the number of horses as well as fighting men in the army. At this point, about two years after the crisis started, the Tang Emperor uh, um, finally decided to move into the Turk uh, territory, attacked and destroyed the Eastern Turk Empire, taking prisoner the Kagan himself. Kept in captivity in humiliating conditions, as the sources tell us, the Kagan died a few years later, allegedly of sorrow and a broken heart. So um, these, these are just some remains from the Turk Empire. Here we see how, how, the, how extensive the Turk Empire was, uh, almost as large as the Tang Dynasty, in fact. Uh, and uh, to summarize our finding here, the, we, uh, just five points. The climatic data do, does indeed show that the main cause, cause of animal mortality and famine was uh, one or more winter disasters and, and uh, uh, and possibly droughts connected with volcanic climate forcing. The subsequent crisis reveals the dependency of the Eastern Turk Empire on the pastoral economy. In other words, their economy was not differentiated enough to be able to um, rely on, on different sources of food or, or, or um, uh, supplies, but rather on the, the, they rather relied on, the, oh, sorry, They rather relied on the taxation from subordinate tribes and of subsidies or tribute from China, which were no longer being paid. The uh, political alienation and hostility of subordinate leaders within the Eastern Turk Empire may have resulted also from a concurrent economic crisis in their territories. So since the crisis weakened the military strength of the Turk Kagan, it made it impossible for him to impose higher taxation or subdue rebellious leaders. In other words, he had lost his military supremacy. The Tang army only attacked the Turk Kagan after he had been sufficiently weakened, although this was presented as being on a higher moral ground. And uh, indeed, uh, this whole episode reveals that the Chinese strategists had a perfect knowledge of the internal situation of the Turks and took advantage of the environmental and economic crisis. And this is something that is uh, uh, repeated also in other, in other cases. The Chinese do rely on the vulnerability of the nomadic economy to um, uh, uh, plan their military strategies. So let me move now to the sec to my second case study. Um, and uh, this is a very different one. This is about a, a, a prolonged drought, the, probably the long, uh, actually certainly the longest drought in the climate history of Mongolia. Uh, which uh, went on for about 60 years from 783 CE to 844. So this is a very, this is a very long, um, this is a very long drought. And again, the climate data come from tree ring uh, based reconstructions from two sites uh, in central Mongolia. Um, there is also another reconstruction based on lake sediments from uh, 
eastern, from Western China, or, or rather um, Eastern Central Asia. Uh, and uh, um, so, um, the difference with this study is that is that the question of um, the historical question of, of how this Uyghur empire survived such a long period of, of drought was not raised by the by the written sources but rather by the climate record itself so in this case it is the climate information that, that generates a question that then historians might, might choose to investigate. Um, Mongolia is indeed a well-documented paleoclimatic history whose investigation started in 1995, so almost 30 years, 25 years ago, um, by the Mongolian American Tree Ring Project. And one of the most important research sites is located in the Okhon Valley in central Mongolia, which was the center of both the Uyghur and the Mongol empires. That is where the capital city, the Uyghur capital city was located. Um, the climate data has been critical in generating not just climate knowledge, but as I just said, uh, questions about, about the, the Uyghur Empire more, more generally. So here, here we have a, um, another reconstruction from the World um, Drought Atlas that, that shows perhaps in better terms uh, why, um, you know, how different the climate appears. Um, in the period of expansion uh, and, uh, and um, establishment of the Uyghur Empire, which was uh, uh, formally established in 744 uh, CE, we, we find that this region, that is Mongolia, is fairly, uh, fairly um, uh, wet precipitation is, is above average. The green is always good, the brown is always bad for some reason, but um, as we move on to the latter part of the Uyghur Empire from 783 to, 8, to 844, we can see that both in Central Asia and Mongolia, the situation changes dramatically with, with a much, uh, much uh, drier, which a much drier climate and, on, and goes on for about 60 years. So um, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, also look at the Uyghur Empire in, a, uh, in a perspective that includes you know, more than just one step empire. That is, the Uyghur Empire presents sp uh, special features that are quite different from other step empires. In the first place, the military activity of the Uyghurs, which was, they were very active in the beginning of their dynasty. They were conquering, they were fighting uh, the enemies of the Tang actually in large part. But uh, the, all of this military activity abated considerably after the onset of the, of the climate crisis. Is there a correlation there? I'm not saying that, I'm just, but this is just a fact. Um, second point is that the Uyghur economy, compared to that, for instance, of the Turk Empire, was remarkably more diversified, including trade, agriculture, and, and urbanization. And um, also, we have a different type of elites that was very, uh, very much engaged, apparently, and invested in the silk trade. A lot of delegations, Uyghur delegations, went to China to trade horse for, horses for silk. Here, we, here you can see in the red, the dry period, in, the blue, in blue, the wet period. This is, is a very, very long period of dry, of dry climate, uh, the longest in uh, uh, almost 2000 years of, uh, Mong of uh, climatic history of uh, Mongolia. Here in uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, signs mark the possible um, construction of cities, and this gray bar indicates the um, beginning uh, and development of uh, horse trade 
with, with China. They may not be terribly relevant, but we included this data to show uh, differences between the, the uh, Uyghur Empire and other and the previous ones. And here you have a map with uh, some of the same information. The uh, Uyghur cities, Baibalik, Porbarjin, Kabalgash, the capital. Here, these are the Ulaanbaatar was not there at the time, so just ignore it. This is just the capital of Mongolia. Um, these uh, Holgo and Ulgat are the two sites from where the three ring chronologies were um, uh, created. And, and this Lake Karakul uh, is where the sediments, lake sediments, uh, or the climatic reconstruction based on lake sediments was, uh, comes from. So, um, so some uh, summary uh, points here. The, uh, the real question is, is the Uyghur Empire, um, Oh, I should say I should say something else. Um, I was getting ahead of myself. Um, the final demise of the Uyghur Empire came at the hands of the Kyrgyz, these people in the north who invaded the Uyghur Empire, destroyed it, and went back to where they came from. Now, it is possible that the vulnerability of the Uyghur Khanate may have been related to a long process of, of military weakening that may, might have to do, uh, might have something to do with the uh, drought uh, crisis that went on for such a, for such a long time. And um, um, although we do not have a particularly good reason to assume, to assume that, um, the question, the real historical question is, is whether the Uyghur example provides uh, some kind of a window into possible ways in which nomadic empires increased their resilience with respect to um, uh, climatic crisis. Uh, the evidence from tree ring data introduced indeed new elements in the historical narrative of the rise and fall of the Uyghur Empire, elements that we did not have before and we do not find in the Chinese sources. Um, also, some, it's interesting to see that contrary to popular belief, uh, we should say, this protracted drought did not trigger migration they did not go on a pillaging uh, invasions of their neighbors, nor did they conquer anyone. Instead, instead, what seems to happen is that the economy of the Uyghur Empire acquires complexity, becomes more diversified, and uh, uh, trade in particular is increased, um, horses are sold to China, Silk is important, and then probably uh, there is a mistake there, and then probably um, traded along the Silk Road. Moreover, agriculture was expanded around the capital for sure, because we have uh, archaeological evidence for that, but possibly also in other areas. Here, archaeological research is still preliminary. Such a diversified economy where we have pastoral economy, trade, agriculture shows a different pattern of sustainability among nomads in the face of, uh, again, protracted environmental crisis and vulnerability. The final collapse of the Uyghur Empire may be connected with the gradual weakening of, the, of, of its military structure, of its military. They had not been uh, active for a long time. Um, there are, there's also a possibility of more immediate causes. The Chinese sources speak of, a, again, one of those winter disasters that uh, um, similar to the one that we have mentioned before about the Eastern Turk Empire with massive loss of, but, um, but we, we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure what, what actually triggered the end of the Uyghur Empire, but there is a distinct possibility that, and I want to stress this again, that some of the, uh, some of the special features that we find in the Uyghur Empire might be related to uh, ways of, um, Offsetting, offsetting the um, crisis induced by this very long, sixty-year-long uh, 
draft. Um, our third case uh, is very different. It's not a crisis. It's actually the opposite. It's what happens when the weather is good, when the climate is, uh, is, is, is favorable in, in the steppes. And this was the first, um, the first article in which I was, uh, I was involved of, of this type. Um, so um, this is to do with the rise climate and the rise of the Mongols and the rise of the Mongol Empire at the time of Chinggis, Chinggis Khan. Um, I've given several talks on this topic and perhaps by now the story is fairly well known, so I won't spend much, much time on this. Um, the, the study came out uh, in 2014 and summarizes the main results of a, a three year long uh, project. Um, climate records <coughs> that were, um, uh, again, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the uh, climatologists were part of this Mongolian American tree ring project. Their data um, show that the early period of expansion of the Mongols under Chinggis Khan was indeed associated with uh, what we may call a pluvial uh, and uh, a clim climatic optimum. A again, it's a fairly long period indicated by this green, green bar for 1206 to 1227, but um, and more specifically from 1210 to 1227. Uh, Chinggis Khan died in 1227, unrelated. Um, green, so by climatic optimum, we mean a long period of above, uh, above average temperature and rainfall favoring uh, above ground net primary productivity, ANPP, which means basically that the grassland became more productive, the biomass increased in, in, what, in what it was and still is a semi-arid region. So what is the impact? What is the effect? that we can presume um, uh, was, was felt in Mongolia at that time. Um, well, first of all, we should say that previous theory assumed that the Mongols had uh, left Mongolia under the leadership of Chinggis Khan because of a drought. Because So th this data immediately contradicted the, the, those previous theories. It was not uh, the drought that pushed the Mongols uh, uh, to conquer uh, Northern China or, or Central Asia, um, but it was, it, there was a different, a different climatic uh, regime at that time, a much more favorable one. Here we can see the, this is a very well known again, um, map of all the conquests and, and especially military campaigns of the Mongols between 1207 and 1227, so 20 years time. Many of, uh, uh, of these years actually correspond, as you can see here, blue again is the color of increased uh, precipitation and rainfall, red means dry, a dry period. Um, so all of these campaigns seem to have taken place during, during this, this wetter, uh, so-called pluvial period, and also quite, quite warm. So, um, so the immediate question is, what, what, was there uh, a, a, an impact of, of this particularly favorable, cli favorable clim climate on the, um, on, on the Mongol army? and on the Mongol uh, campaigns. Um, or to put the question in a, in a different way, was the energy generated by favorable environmental conditions a factor in allowing Chinggis Khan to, and, the, and his Mongol generals to conduct so many um, um, campaigns, so many expeditions, so many conquests uh, outside of Mongolia in, in such a, a relatively short period period of time. Here you can see in this map how uh, 
the um, territory under Mongol rule expanded under Chinggis Khan at this time, reaching all the way into uh, what is today Uzbekistan and, and Northern China. So um, the result of this study in, in a way is what uh, I called the grassland high productivity hypothesis. And the main points are, are here. Um, so positive climate, more favorable climate may have increased, uh, uh, may have um, favored the economic recovery after a very, very long period of civil war in Mongolia. Let's not forget that Genghis Khan became the uh, universal ruler of the Mongols uh, in 1206 after many, many years uh, of uh, uh, almost over two decades of civil war. Um, because there is a positive correlation between high productivity and, and um, uh, survival of, uh, of animals after birth, in other words, there is a lower mortality of, of animals, we can assume that over the, the, those good years, let's say, there was a reliable yearly supply of horses. Uh, horses were, of course, the main uh, uh, the main weapon, if you like, of, of the Mongol army. I mean, without horses, they would not have been able to, to go to war, essentially. So uh, a supply of horses was, was essential. Um, also, we have um, uh, a higher carrying capacity of the land. Uh, Chinggis Khan and, and his uh, uh, bodyguards, his army, his court, his government, could concentrate in a relatively smaller, uh, uh, um, smaller area. And that favored or supported the formation and, and, and functioning of a centralized government within a nomadic, uh, within a nomadic society. And finally, uh, there is also some evidence that um, the, um, uh, for the expansion of of economy with uh, um, some agricultural some agricultural production. Um, by the way, I should say that urbanism and agricultural production are very important areas of research in uh, in Eurasian studies, in, in Eurasian archaeology, and so on. We should not think of uh, the nomadic societies being purely pastoral. There is always a mixture of different economic activities there. My last case, and I, I have another few minutes, I believe, for uh, um, uh, is 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 again is again a different is again a different one. Until now, we have looked at um, first a catastrophic and sudden event, then uh, the, the the one of that I mentioned of the Eastern Turk Empire. Then we have uh, looked at the period of uh, long, uh, uh, prolonged drought and negative conditions. Then we have looked at the Mongol the rise of the Mongols with a climatic upturn and environmental improvement. This case is very different. And um, this is about um, a climatic change or transition that was is not catastrophic but sufficient to alter environmental conditions to the point that they might have an impact on uh, tactical strategic uh, decisions made by the Mongol leadership in relations to their uh, invasion and then withdrawal from Hungary um, in 1242. So what this study does, in my view, is uh, to shed light on uh, how dependent medieval nomadic armies were upon environmental conditions. And so it tells us something important about how they operated and, uh, and also the limits, the limits of their, of their reach and of their uh, operations themselves. So the case in question, uh, we, should, we should describe uh, briefly what, what happens. Um, most people know that uh, the Mongols in the April of uh, 1241 invaded, well, they attacked um, 
uh, Leibniz or Leibniz in, in Poland and almost at the same time, I mean, amazing coordination. If you think about it, April 9, April 11, they attacked uh, the um, Hungary having marched through different, uh, uh, three different uh, mountain passes across the Carpathian Mountains. So in red, you will see here, um, oh, I'm sorry, there is a mistake here. This should be in 1241 as, as marked here. Um, the Mongols uh, uh, advanced into Hungary and found essentially no resistance. They, they stormed several castles, several towns, uh, until, uh, until they, they reached the very center of, uh, the very center of, 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 of Hungary. In the meantime, the um, King Bela IV uh, fled. So neither field armies nor fortresses, fortified places, really offered any significant resistance. But as we look at the eastern part of Hungary, I mean, western part of Hungary, um, in blue, we see actually a lot of places that were not conquered by the Mongols. The Mongols were far less successful once they crossed the Danube and went into western Hungary. And that happened in uh, uh, early months of uh, of 1242. Um, later in the spring and summer of 1242, the Mongols started to withdraw from Hungary and returned to the South Volga steppes in Russia. So um, this is briefly the situation. And what we asked uh, in our research question in this study is, was climate in any way uh, in any way uh, responsible for the withdrawal of the of the of the mongols uh, the sources told us one important thing and that was the beginning of our research question and that is that in the winter of 1240 that is january of 1242 the danube froze solid and that allows the Mongols actually to ride across the Danube and invade Western and invade Western Hungary. So, um, did this uh, particular uh, occurrence, this this change, this this drop in temperature and very cold winter, in any way uh, have an impact? It was sort of wild questions in some in some way, but that was the starting point. We started to look at the, at the changes in, uh, in the uh, uh, Hungarian um, uh, weather, really, during, the, during this period. And um, the analysis of the climate was based on, again, on three, three ring-based chronologies, five of them. You can see here, uh, especially the Carpathians and the Alps, chronology, which are the most relevant also to this, uh, to this uh, uh, area, a significant drop in temperature between 1241 and 1242. The same can be seen here. You see, well, this reddish means warmer temperature. This bluish means colder temperature. Again, this is quite visible. And you will have to wait until a few, a few years, two or three years until temperature become no, more or less uh, warmer, warm again. Uh, now in themselves, these changes may not be particularly significant. Um, in fact, they help the Mongols extend their conquest to Western Hungary by crossing the, by crossing the frozen uh, Danube. Except that there was also something else happening, uh, and the, the, the precipitation uh, uh, increased also during the during the winter uh, and uh, um, the winter between 1241 and 1242, and these are uh, um, uh, again drought reconstructions. We can see that 1241 was relatively dry. Again, brown is dry, green is uh, wet, uh, 
and uh, the following year was was particularly um, was rather wet wetter than 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 it would normally be so um so what happens what happens is that between the moment when the mongols entered hungary and uh, and and the winter the situation changed and went from uh, relatively warm and dry to relatively cold or rather cold and, and, and wet. Um, so increasing rainfall, snowfall during the, uh, during the winter. Uh, now, the next thing that we looked at once we, uh, once we ascertained this situation, uh, was the particular hydrogeology of of Hungary, which is fairly which is fairly specific, and and uh, Hungary is a high water table, which is especially prone to flooding. And in fact, there is a whole flood history of Hungary uh, that continued until the Habsburgs in the eighteenth uh, and nineteenth century. Um, build uh, canals to drain the uh, floodplains of several of several rivers in in Hungary, um, but otherwise, but otherwise, uh, uh, Hungary was very very uh, um, subject to periodic periodic floods. So our hypothesis, um, not to be too long on this, was that the um, uh, excess water froze on the ground. There was an excess of of uh, uh, snow and rain that actually froze on the. I mean, the Danube froze certainly, rain and 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 snow also also froze. And that this particular uh, abundance of water was not absorbed in the spring as the as the ice uh, thawed. Um, and uh, the, the, re the result of the situation was an increase in uh, a dramatic increase in uh, uh, swamps and marshlands across uh, across Hungary. And uh, again, this is not an unusual situation in Hungary. We found it in uh, on several on several occasions. So. Um, um, okay. Yes. As the above ground uh, pooling of water and marshland formation uh, occurred, so we have to ask ourselves what is this, uh, what effect does this situation have on a Mongol army? <laughs> on a Mongol army? Could this be the reason why their effectiveness was so much reduced? in Western Hungary with respect to Eastern Hungary. And basically we came to the conclusion that yes, indeed, because of the ways in which the Mongol army uh, worked with 300,000 horses probably stuck in mud at that point, um, this may be a reason why the effectiveness of the military was, was, uh, was, was so much reduced and indeed why eventually the um, Mongol uh, leaders might have decided that their level of vulnerability was high enough that they it would have been more prudent to actually leave Hungary and return to and return to Russia. There are many other um, hypotheses and and uh, um, and uh, theories about the Mongol withdrawal from Hungary. But what we did was to introduce to reconstruct the climate picture that gave us some insights into a possible reason why the Mongol army stuck there surrounded by enemies may have uh, not been able to uh, remain in Hungary and uh, as, as, as it were, uh, wait until the situation became uh, better again and preferred rather to, um, in fact, they took a sudden route to um, uh, avoiding the floodplains at a higher elevation to, to withdraw. So what are the, um, Final points here. Dry warm weather initially favored the Mongol invasion of Hungary. The Danube froze, as I said, above average snow and rainfall caused an accumulation of frozen water that when thawing flooded various, various areas causing swampy conditions. 
And, um, you know, again, the hydrogeology of Hungary also shows, I mean, this is a fairly complex, complex study. And uh, I'm, I'm not saying that we have solved the problem of the withdrawal of the Mongols, but this is yet another theory or another hypothesis that should be considered. Um, I'm out of time, I think. Let me just uh, conclude with some very, uh, with some final thoughts. Uh, to wrap up this, uh, this talk, the climate history of Mongolia provides critical insights uh, into the history of medieval nomadic empires and should be regarded as an important source of information. I hope I've demonstrated that in this, uh, with this talk, but of course much remains, uh, much remains to, 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 be, to be done. F fortunately, we have um, um, overcome some of the, um, of, of the older theories that uh, have really no basis in, uh, uh, in reality when we look at the climate uh, in the climate data. Um, lacking other sources and analysis of the relationship between society and environment can provide data about vulnerability, resilience, uh, and, and the social and political consequences of climatic variability. Um, that is to say, by looking at environmental changes and factoring them in our study of social and political change, we can expand really our analytical range to issues such as animal mortality, grassland productivity, and they have a much better uh, sense of the actual challenges met by these people as they were uh, either uh, um, building their empires or trying to keep them. Uh, and finally, the case studies discussed, um, uh, discussed here should really not be seen as disjointed from a broader historical uh, perspective on inner Asian nomadic empire. That means that I would like to see the many challenges presented by environmental cha uh, changes to nomadic societies as an integral component of their economic, social, and political history. I mean, I think we need to start asking what solutions they found to uh, overcome such environmental challenges and whether such solutions can provide insights on broader questions related to state building, for instance, or imperial governance. And that is indeed a long road ahead. And thank you very much for listening to this long talk. Excellent, thank you very much, Professor De Cosmo. Um, okay, so I, I've invited people to start posting questions and, and Bob Himes had jumped to the gun when you were talking about the Uyghur drought, the second case study with the Uyghur drought maps. And I think it came, the same sort of maps came up in your last case study. And the question was that these drought maps, the green versus brown areas, seem to show quite high resolution of local differences in rainfall, sometimes quite small dots of brown and so on. What data have allowed such differentiation of rainfall levels from one area to the next? Um, it, you know, if, the, if it's the tree ring data, uh, that seemed to only come from a few locations. But if you can talk about that, the the drought maps or the the hydro maps. Yes, the the I mean, we we have a a very important tool which is uh, the hydro maps come from the World Drought Atlas as, uh, uh, and uh, one of the main uh, person is actually Professor at Columbia University, uh, Ed Cook, uh, who uh, produced this. And this is a combination of data from a lot of different, a lot of different uh, sources. So uh, there is not single, single uh, source that, uh, that allows us to reconstruct the hydroclimate as far as I understand it in the drought atlas. They come from very different uh, uh, an input of, uh, of uh, both reconstructions and assume a certain amount of modeling as well. So um, I, I can't really respond to the question of, of the, uh, of the uh, regional variations from that, but it's uh, something that would have to be uh, 
uh, answered by going to the sources of these, uh, to the specific sources of these maps that are created by climatologists and are, and, and also I assume change with more data getting into the, uh, into the equation as it were, into the uh, creation of this, of this, of these maps. The two, um, the two tree ring, uh, tree ring, um, uh, um, recon, recon, climatic reconstructions are uh, are very consistent with each other actually, and they come from two areas in central Mongolia. Yes, so they re reflect a, region, a regional situation, but this situation is fairly uh, um, reliable, especially especially for Western Mongolia. Maybe not so much for Eastern Mongolia. It would be very nice to have a, a tree ring reconstruction from Eastern Mongolia as well, because actually the climate of uh, Mongolia is considered to be, uh, there is a certain difference between due to elevation and mountain ranges and so on, and, 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 and circulation of moisture and so on between Eastern Mongolia and, and, and Western Mongolia. In other words, uh, climatologists have found that there is um, that there is a substantial uh, difference in uh, in the way they uh, these two regions react to certain periodic climatic fluctuations and uh, in, in uh, uh, swings between uh, high um, low temperature high temperature uh, in particular are higher in Western Mongolia than they are in Eastern, Eastern Mongolia. In other words, the, the swings are more severe in one area than in another area. Um, there is always a certain amount of approximation in these reconstructions. Uh, one cannot, but I, I think spatial, spatial correlations with uh, always compared with contemporary uh, uh, data, which come generated by machines, of course, um, are, are very useful, and uh, so there is a certain amount of uh, of, 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 of uh, credibility, I would say, to this data. And uh, and uh, um, there was a very long drought in China. We can go back also to other regions around Mongolia, and in fact, we can find a very long drought in northern China as well, in Central Asia. So it, it's a, it's a I assume it's a generic it's a generic period of of of, of drought, but um, the reason why we have such a long drought is uh, I I can I certainly cannot answer, and it's probably not not so important a question. Thank you. And and the next question gets into I guess a little more of the details of how you negotiate with this data, right? And in climate history, it seems not all proxy data always agrees. How do you negotiate this contradictory proxy data when weighting causality? And, and uh, I mean, one of the questions I'd add to that is, you know, who, who are you working with? Do you find scientists to, to sort of sort out these things? Um, but just to continue with that question, for instance, in terms of the pluvials period, Mongolian tree ring data indicates lush growth and a larger carrying capacity, but data from the Altai region, both Russian and Chinese sides presents evidence for deforestation. There's no absolutely no absolute way to know that it was anthropogenic or not. Some have suggested overgrazing. Um, and Aaron says, I've, I've seen even a paper on instances of drought in the Tarim Basin using lake beds and pollen. So in light of this and the intense regional variation, how do we weight our primary da data set when we were faced with this type of challenge. I mean, you, you've addressed some of those issues with the Eastern and Western Mongolia, but specifically maybe, you know, bring in the role of the scientists and how, how they, if uh, assuming they help you sort these issues out. Um, when, when, I, when I mentioned in my, in my talk that is really, frustrating uh, to have very uh, relatively little control over the climate data because uh, of course this is not something that I can uh, I can I can generate myself or, or, or control much I mean this is exactly the, the point that we have sometimes different uh, different um, um, data which do not agree with each other at, at, at all I, I've met this 
problem uh, in the most uh, um, frustrating way, in fact, when I wrote another article that uh, I wrote by myself, in fact, and, uh, and I did not include, it's not been published yet, I did not include, uh, in, and it's an article on general climate situation of the Mongol, uh, of the Mongol conquest. So including the Tarim Basin, for instance, there is an article by Putnam on uh, Putnam et al uh, on, um, on the Tarim Basin. And it agrees with the Mongol data in terms of precipitation. In other words, it says that at the same time as the Mongols were moving into um, the Tian Shan and, 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 and oh, of course the Mongols never conquered the Tarim Basin, the Uyghur principality simply surrendered. But as the Mongols were moving west, um, there is a general uh, rainy period, but the Putnam reconstructions of temperature is very different because they thought they, thought they had evidence of, of low temperatures, of colder, colder climate than uh, we find in Mongolia, for instance. So that's, that's a fairly, fairly important difference. And so there are debates among climatologists. In fact, there are lots of debates <laughs> among climatologists. And much of this is really, uh, I mean, we call it science, but this data has to have to be interpreted. And uh, the way that, that, we, that people interpret data is it varies varies according to specialization and according especially to the type of proxies that you're using. If you are using sediments and pollen and so on, and it's very different from, from, from tree ring reconstruction as we, as we all know. So um, it, it, it's, uh, um, it, it's not a science uh, that, that we can fully rely on, in other words, it's it, to a certain degree accretional. That is, the more data we, uh, we, we have, the more, uh, the more we can say about, about a particular region and so on. But let's, let's face it, I mean, these advances have been made over the past, you know, not so many years, 10, 20 years. Uh, we already know a lot more about regional variability than we did a long, uh, not so long time, not such a long time ago. We are no longer looking at hemispheric level uh, 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 reconstructions. We are looking at much more detailed year to year reconstruction and they, they are not precise. So, um, but the idea of a 60 year long drought, I can rely on that, I would say, because it is confirmed by so many different, uh, different um, data. Great. I, I want to skip to um, toward the bottom where, where Dorothy uh, Co raises the point, uh, thanking you for affirming the usefulness of the case study approach, um, but asking once we depart from the case study mode and making connections across wide time and space, uh, suggesting we need to think about contingency and historical causality in very unconventional ways. Um, and, and she'd like to hear your uh, insights on this issue. Um, yes, um, I, I I really would. Uh, I mean, we we really really need to think quite a lot about about the, we sh we should have a completely different uh, talk about causality and. I, I think uh, I, I would like to um, eliminate as much as possible the, the causality problem in the sense that um, historical, uh, of course, is, I, I, I do not dismiss causality in any ways, but um, the way in which uh, I, I think of, of, uh, of uh, historical problems is, is not so much to see, you know, what causes causes what, but rather reconstruct a, 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 with as much precision uh, as, as possible, reconstruct an event, if we are talking about an event, or reconstructing a, um, um, a, 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 or addressing, actually, rather than reconstruct, addressing a particular problem. Um, 
So um, let's uh, uh, talk about, for instance, um, empire building in a nomadic empire. You know, how do you create? Do you create an empire? Now that that can be approached in many different ways. We can start. Uh, we can start looking at different empires, compare them with one another, and. Um, um, so what kind of connections, when you say connections across w uh, wide time and space, we, we need to look at what connections we are looking for. <laughs> um, uh, we, we, I co-edited a book recently called uh, Eurasian Empires and Exchange, which was all about connections all over in late antiquity, all over Eurasia. But we found this exactly this problem of identifying uh, the connections that we wanted to uh, highlight or, or, or focus on. And uh, it could be material exchange, it could be diplomatic exchange, it could be ideas, it could be all sorts of things. And they all uh, have different vectors, if you like, and different ways of, of, uh, of uh, manifesting themselves. So, I personally would uh, prefer to, um, uh, to, to go into a more descriptive mode, perhaps, in which we document certain things before thinking about causality necessarily. And I don't know whether I'm expressing myself uh, um, sufficiently, sufficiently well here, but um, I, I, I personally am very cautious about, about causality, especially when it comes to, uh, to uh, climate, uh, um, um, climate events and human events. I mean, there is just too much uh, uh, causality linked to correlations or, uh, or married, in a sense, to a correlative thought in uh, in the sciences, and and uh, and uh, the first uh, um, the first task I, I would say from my point of view is to uh, eliminate certain ways in which we build in my view spurious spurious causality, rather than uh, uh, try to uh, try to make connections and attribute some sort of causal mechanisms to that to them. I'm, I'm not sure whether that is clear, but I'd be happy to clarify further. Thank you. Um, and uh, one of the graduate students in Tibetan studies, Cameron Foltz, has asked, uh, says, as, you, as you've said, it seems that climate data might be most useful for periods lacking plentiful sources for later periods with more sources. Do you think this kind of data can still raise useful questions that aren't present in more typical kinds of sources? Are there other ways in which using this data for historical research in better docu documented periods varies. And is it just chance that you have these four case studies that kind of are for periods that don't have a lot of written sources? Or do you, have you done similar work in the Qing that, you know, where you're comparing, you know, the scientific evidence with more plentiful sources? I added that last bit. So I'm sorry, what question is this? Who, uh, who, right who? above Dorothy Coe's question. Oh, oh, okay, yes. Oh, Cameron Fox, yes. Um, so, so, I mean, there is a, a very strong, a strong element of serendipity here uh, on, on how we choose certain, certain topics and certain case studies. Um, and, um, it's it's hard to um, it's hard to uh, actually uh, come up with a, I mean they are all they are all generated in different ways. Uh, the first one in which I participated, which was the Mongol uh, the rise of the Mongols. I mean I was just asked to be in a in a in an NSF funded project with climatologists because they wanted to have somebody who could tell them something about the history and then that that started as a purely uh, climatic study and only later when they found that actually there was an interesting uh, an interesting um, correlation between the uh, uh, pluvial the rainy period and the mongol uh, expansion that 
that we started to look into uh, into the um, into the possibility that in fact all the theory may have been wrong and and we were looking at a different at a different dynamic um, the um, Eastern Turk Empire was uh, was actually based on uh, a Chinese publication that was that came before before our publication. So we didn't identify that problem; it was identified by somebody somebody else. But um, that was based mostly on written sources. So we supplied the climatic uh, interpretations and reconstructions, and intervene. And there are many articles actually on that uh, on that particular event uh, by by climate scientists. Um, the Uyghur one was again, uh, as, as I mentioned, it, it was uh, it, it was uh, an anomaly. Let's say in the in the climate data that that uh, triggered an, an historical interest and, and a whole chain of, uh, of reflections, if you like, on, on, on what what might have been the, the social impact of, of this uh, or the economic impact of that. And finally, the Hungarian case was, uh, was just because I was curious, but I was never persuaded by the various um, by the various uh, explanations, uh, the death of Ogode and many other explanations for the withdrawal of Batu, the commander of the Mongols in Hungary. Um, and so we, uh, because we had enough data for that, I mean, there, it, it's fairly well documented uh, b because it's Europe and because we have uh, Alpine and, and, and other reconstructions. Uh, there was enough data to actually uh, pinpoint the, the, that particular change on a very, very specific period of time, which was, uh, you know, over a 12-month uh, period. Um, so so it, it's very serendipitous, I would say, and um, I don't plan on continuing like, like this, but uh, I think there is, as I said before, I mean, there is an accretional uh, uh, element in all of this, the more we study uh, this, this, this climate uh, history connection, the more, I, I would say, we can understand how the, um, um, uh, how these uh, um, uh, pastoral nomads or uh, uh, nomadic empires, whichever you want to call it, uh, managed to respond to these uh, challenges, uh, disasters, crisis, or or vice versa, good good period of so. And I think Gray was uh, you were saying something about the Qing period, right? Oh, there is a very, very interesting case about the late Ming. As, as we know, you know, the little ice age and, and a certain an awareness of, a, of a, a climate induced disasters in northern China in the late Ming have, have changed quite dramatically our understanding of the fall of the Ming and the Ming Qing transition, right? I mean, in the 50s and 60s, we didn't know that climate had such a big impact. Now the disasters in northern China appear and, and the rebellions, Li Zicheng and so on, appear to be um, more and more uh, uh, closely related to the in onset of the Little Ice Age and a number of other climatic. Uh, so I was interested in, in looking at, uh, at the Northeast and Manchuria and, 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 the, and the base of the Manchus, uh, the Manchu region as uh, in, in, in climate terms. In other words, uh, if the Manchus had the same disasters and challenges that the Ming had in Northern China, how could they actually uh, master the, the, the army, the strength, the resources to to carry out their conquest. I mean, this is very, very simplistic, uh, if you like, conquest. But um, a couple of studies have come out of China uh, on, on this. And uh, I think there is a clear evidence, I would say clear evidence that the Manchurian and the Northern China climate are completely different. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, we really need to reassess some, Everything that has been said on the on the on the Manchurian climate until now, including by uh, 
uh, Jeffrey Parker and a number of other people who just assumed that the Manchus were um, uh, uh, faced with the same sort of challenges that the Chinese, uh, the Chinese were. It, th they certainly were, there were certainly some challenges, but um, the, the climate picture is, is, is quite different. And, uh, and, and so that needs to be, I think, also folded into uh, some kind of theory of the Manchu conquest of China and the Ming-Ching transition, which we still don't have, actually. So Chuck Woolridge had raised the question of climate and weather, but we're almost out of time. So I'm going to point him and anyone else who's interested to your website at the Institute for Advanced Studies, to the blog posts that you have up there. Uh, that address that and turn to the very last question raised by Eugenia Lean, because it, it's certainly one that that had me thinking, your talk had me thinking about this as well. Um, and it's, can you speak more about the nature of your collaboration with scientists? What were their motivations to work with you as a historian? Were there large epistemological gaps in terms of how you approach the data? Um, do they employ historical data to shape their conclusions? Well, there are challenges at every corner <laughs> there, <laughs> and and very and very complicated. I mean, the main challenge is, is sort of hinted at is that there are really you know academic structures that facilitate collaboration between scientists and anything. This is uh, so that there are. Yeah, you know, I, I really want to stress how experimental this period is in this. So different people have different solutions, and uh, you know, so, some are creating very large, complicated uh, um, projects that that require millions of, of euros or dollars in financing, uh, and so and that is one model, but. Um, clearly not every historian who is wants to uh, wants to. Um, uh, introduce climatic data is interested in environmental uh, history and so on uh, can or, or should in my view uh, apply for a major grant in order to do this uh, we should also be uh, able to rely on the small forms of collaborations with between scientists and historians and uh, and and that has been my model you know to look for small collaborations with people that i that find uh, scientists that find an added value in looking at uh, the social or, or 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 economic implications of uh, of climatic variability and climatic change and there are many of them um so uh, it's just a matter of finding like-minded, like-minded people. But the another challenge is where to publish. I mean, this is this is complicated because um, I mean, science is extremely competitive. You know, getting an article in one of the major journals is very difficult, and there, there is there is a certain uh, I think a very relatively low level of tolerance for high uh, a, a, a high dose of of science in. Uh, in uh, historical journals as well, <laughs> you know, so it, it is difficult to um, to mediate between the particular um, uh, disciplinary disciplinary areas in which we are uh, we are operating. Uh, so getting in between, uh, of course, there's a there's a gap that must be negotiated, but it's not so easy, and uh, um, this is completely uh, unknown territory in a sense, I mean, uncharted uh, territory for quite, quite a lot of people. Uh, but I, I really like my collaborators. My, uh, I, I, I hope to expand the range of people with whom to collaborate, but um, it, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not very easy, just as simple as that. Okay, well, on that note and perfectly on, on time, um, I think maybe we'll uh, just thank you for your presentation and a feeling thank you very much, much, Gray. And I thank you to everybody who has uh, been uh, patient enough to listen to my talk. All right. Very good. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, the Weatherhead and Eugenia and Adam and the History Department and East Asian Languages and Cultures for sponsoring this event.